Today's video is sponsored by our friends at Sketchcase. Unleash your creativity and turn your laptop into a portable whiteboard with Sketchcase. This isn't your ordinary laptop skin. You can use dry, wet, or even permanent markers on it. Whether you're a student, designer, developer, engineer, or entrepreneur, you're going to love using Sketchcase. Check them out today at Sketchcase.com. Hey, what's happening everybody? It's Greg here with Technically Speaking, and this week we're gonna do something a little bit different. But one of the most successful videos we've put out on our channel is a review of Google Wi-Fi. Now, if you look at the comments section, there's a ton of really great comments in there. Some of the explanations are a little bit hard to put concisely into text, so my hope is that this follow-up video might explain some things or encourage some of you that are still considering whether or not Google Wi-Fi is worth the investment to just go ahead and jump into it. All right, so let's start out with Mark's question where he basically wants to know if Google tracks you if you're using Google Wi-Fi. So if we look at the link that I have down in the description and I'll put it up on screen here too, I'm gonna read directly from the support page here. Importantly, the Google Wi-Fi app and your Wi-Fi points do not track the websites you visit or collect the content of any traffic on your network. However, your Wi-Fi point does collect data such as Wi-Fi channel, signal strength, and device types that are relevant to optimizing your Wi-Fi performance. Additionally, once you have the Google Wi-Fi app downloaded onto your phone, you can go into the privacy section and opt out of most, if not all of these data collection points. So next question comes from Guardian's Creed. Does it have any parental controls and will it let me monitor devices? Okay, there are some limited parental controls. So if you look at the Google Wi-Fi app, you actually have the ability to take other devices that are connected to Google Wi-Fi, group them together, and then control internet access to that group of devices. So the example that I'll use here and one of the examples that I used in the original review video is if you have kids and they've got you know an iPhone, an iPad, you can take those devices, group them together, and then control the internet access access directly to that group of devices. So you can shut off the internet entirely uh, as a kind of signal to, hey, come downstairs because I need you, it's time to eat, or shut off the internet because it's time to go to bed. But that's about the extent of the controls that you have. What you cannot do is directly see which websites they're visiting or anything like that. Um, you can see the amount of traffic that is being used by individual devices. Now, I personally find this particularly useful uh, if my wife says, hey, the internet's running really slow, are you downloading something? I can basically look at Google Wi-Fi's app and then figure out exactly which device is hogging up all the bandwidth. In most cases, it's something involving Netflix. John wants to know whether or not anyone has tried these outside of the US in an unsupported country and whether or not they work. Broadly speaking, yes, they should work outside of the US. So there's some caveats to that. Um, they are built with the US market in mind, so they still use kind of the standard, terribly designed US power plug. Uh, but as long as you have some type of a converter and you match voltages and stuff like that, there's really no technical reason why they shouldn't work uh, in a country outside of the United States. Mr. Donkey Boy says, my house is just around 1600 square feet, so is it worth it to buy just one of these or is it better for big houses that way you can use all three of them? Okay, this is a great example of a question that's really difficult to answer directly uh, because it has a bunch of variables. In it. So if you look at Google's website, they say that each individual puck averages about 1500 square feet worth of coverage. Now that means that it's also assuming that you have kind of a standard timber construction in your house. So think basic drywall, not terribly thick, uh, two by fours, uh, and maybe some insulation, maybe, uh, but that's it. So if you have anything more than that, you're probably gonna get less than 1500 square feet. So the general rule of thumb is density is the enemy of Wi-Fi signal. So if you have concrete walls, brick masonry, anything really, really thick, really, really dense, that's gonna block the majority of the Wi-Fi signal from penetrating through that wall. And you're gonna get less than 1500 square foot worth of coverage out of that individual puck. So just because your house is 1600 square feet and Google says that it'll cover 1500 square feet doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the woods and you only need one device. Think about the construction of 
the home or the residence, the apartment, the condo, whatever whatever it is that you're living in and kind of make your own assessment. The other thing to keep in mind too is uh, proximity to electronics. So if you have older microwaves or, or baby monitors or uh, a bunch of other Wi-Fi networks in the area, high tension power lines, all of those things produce electronic interference, which can also limit the signal strength and the penetration that your Wi-Fi network will have in your home. Now, the cool thing is if it is network related, like let's say you live in a heavily populated area with a bunch of other Wi-Fi networks, it will dynamically adjust to try and maximize the strength and integrity of its signal, but it can't really do anything about microwaves. Tyler wants to know whether or not this will increase your internet speeds. Okay, broadly speaking, maybe. Uh, I'm gonna start by referring you to the previous answer because for the most part, most slow internet speeds are a product of signal interference or poor Wi-Fi coverage or something along those lines. So see the previous answer first of all. Second of all, um, Google Wi-Fi is not magic in the sense that it's not just going to magically give you faster internet if you don't already have fast internet coming from your internet service provider. So what I mean by that is take a look at your service, take a look at your bill next time, and if you're only paying for 10 megabit service down, you're not going to magically get 50 megabits. Your connection to the router will probably be faster than that, but your connection from the router out to the internet is still limited by whatever service you're purchasing from your internet service provider. Okay, there's a ton of questions about gaming, um, whether or not you can game on it, uh, whether or not there's lag, uh, the, the speeds that you'll get out of this system once you have it fully set up in mesh network mode. Short version, yes, you can game on it, uh, but if lag is that much of a concern to you, you probably wanna be hardwired anyway. Uh, at the end of the day, hardwired is always going to be wireless. There is always going to be a certain amount of latency that is introduced into your gameplay if you are playing on the wireless. The next most common question that I got was regarding setup, including one in particular that asked whether or not you can run um, Ethernet from the port on each one of these pucks back to the main router. Yes, you can do a wired backhaul, but there's a bunch of caveats. If you're an advanced enough user to be concerned about um, how you're going to physically wire each of these individual pucks and how to do a wired backhaul and that sort of thing, you're probably right on the edge of whether or not Google Wi-Fi is the right product for you. There are a number of limitations when it comes to people who have some advanced understanding of how to do network. And so case in point, you cannot specify additional subnets that you want the Wi-Fi pucks to occupy. The subnet that you get is the subnet that you get. So it's 192.168.76. something in most cases. Uh, and you can't change that. Similarly, uh, there are some significant limitations that you have in terms of how you can have these things configured. So I, rather than answer the question directly, I'm going to actually point a link back to Google support site. There are several supported network setups, um, some of them which do have wired backhaul, some of them that do not. So what you're going to want to do is check the documentation for more. That will be your best friend. Another super duper common question. I have X service. Will Google Wi-Fi work with my internet service provider? Again, for the most part, unless you have a really weird and unique setup, the answer is yes. Uh, Google Wi-Fi's uh, internet service provider agnostic. As long as you get Cat5 out of that, you can plug it into Google Wi-Fi and you should be good to go. Similarly, Ricky wants to know whether or not Google Wi-Fi produces its own Wi-Fi or act as another router. I think if I understand your question correctly, the answer is, uh, Yes to both, I guess. Uh, so Google Wi-Fi does produce its own wireless signal. Um, in a lot of cases that will maybe interfere with or overlap on top of an existing wireless signal that you have. So to break it down, when you go out to your internet service provider and you purchase service through them, they will provide you with a device, a residential gateway of some variety that usually acts as, among other things, a wireless gateway. So if you install Google Wi-Fi alongside of your existing router, what you end up with is a Google Wi-Fi network and then your old ISP wireless network that's hanging out there. A lot of times that can cause interference. So uh, although Google Wi-Fi does provide its own wireless signal, best practice is to go ahead and disable the wireless that's on your router just to kind of make things nice and clean. Kim wants to know if you have to install an app to be able to make the mesh network work. Initially, yes. So the, the way that you create the mesh network, um, I referred to this a little bit in the original video, which I will link up here. Um, the way that you 
initially set up the network is via your smartphone. So you do have to have an app. Um, the app does exist on iOS and Android. So even if you don't have an Android phone, you can still use Google Wi-Fi, which is great news. It requires you to have a smartphone because you have to scan the barcodes on the bottom of each individual puck. Once you have the initial setup done and you have the mesh built, you don't need the app. Now, I would definitely recommend that you keep the app on your phone because that is the management interface that you will use to do all things Google Wi-Fi re related. So if you need to restart the devices or if you need to prioritize devices or referring to the original question uh, <laughs> that started this whole video off, the Wi-Fi app is also how you will uh, pause internet access or shut off internet access for your group of devices that you have set up. So. You don't need it for the mesh. You can successfully uninstall it, but you're also going to limit how much management you can do. Okay, last question. Ben wants to know how much this cost per month. Um, this was kind of a surprisingly common sentiment where people weren't quite understanding what service you'd get. Since Google's name was attached to it, they didn't know whether or not you were getting internet via Google Wi-Fi. Um, so that's where the question about monthly prices came in, I think. To be clear, there's no monthly fee attached to this. There's no daily, monthly, yearly, decadely, whatever. There's no fee attached to this. Once you buy the device, you physically have the device. You still have to have an internet service provider to get out to the internet. What this does only is provide you a wireless access point so that you can connect your laptop or phone or what have you. You can connect to a wireless network that will then take you onto the internet provided that you already have internet set up. So there's no fee involved in this at all. Okay, before I wrap up, there's a little bit of housekeeping I need to do. So we are doing a giveaway for a Super Nintendo Classic. Uh, these are a little difficult to get a hold of right now. Uh, I actually have one of these myself. We got a second one just to be able to do the giveaway. They are awesome. I absolutely love this thing. Uh, I was a child of the 90s. All the games that are on here are games that I played a ton of when I was growing up. I cannot recommend this device enough. So if you want a chance, to win a Super Nintendo Classic, check the comment section down below, enter the giveaway. We will be doing the drawing for this next Friday, October 13th, Friday the 13th. What a weirdly unlucky day to have such an awesome drawing. So again, enter the contest if you want a chance to win a Super Nintendo Classic. And if you want to know who wins live, check out our live show we do every single Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. That's it for this week. Thank you all for stopping by. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I will catch you guys next time.